Greetings, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mark Timbrook, and I'm the channel marketing manager for BMD, and I work with our one-step businesses, Mole Millwork, Kansas City Millwork, and Clear Ovations. And I'm excited to have our guest with us today, Anne Edminster, and she is a leading international expert on zero energy efficient green homes. She's the founder and principal of Design Avenues, LLC, and she consults with builders, developers, homeowners, supply chain clients, investors, utilities, design firms, public agencies, and nonprofits from local to uh, international organizations. Um, she also has an award-winning book, Energy Free Homes for a Small Planet, and it's a comprehensive, um, excuse me, a comprehensive guide for designers and builders seeking to create zero energy or ZE homes. She assists design teams pursuing ZE performance goals, has developed curricula for design and construction of ZE homes, and is a frequent keynote speaker, pre uh, presenter, and teacher at conferences, universities, nonprofits, and utilities. Easy for me to say. That was great. So um, welcome, Anne. It's great to have you with us today. Thanks so much, Mark. And uh, my bio is always entertaining for me to hear because it reminds me of what a short attention span I have. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, you've got a lot of accomplishments, so we tried to summarize as best we could. But um, we definitely recognize you as an expert in the field, and, and we're glad to have you. So we're going to talk about um, Zieni. And so I'll just jump in right away and just say, what is ZNE? Well, that's a great question, Mark, and uh, don't necessarily assume everybody knows what we're talking about here. Um, as the title slide indicates, it actually represents several different things. Um, initially, ZNE, or sometimes NZE, or if you're Canadian, NZE, was net zero or zero net energy. Uh, but in recent times, uh, well, really, honestly, for the history of this movement, there's been a fluctuation around the definition. And so the E has potentially three different meanings, energy, electricity, or emissions. And um, yet there is a common foundation for all of them. In all cases, what we're really talking about is taking a conventional building and uh, optimizing the efficiency of that building so that we're able to meet its energy demand with renewable energy production, typically on site. And uh, so there's really two sides to this equation, the consumption and the production side of the equation. And I'll get into a little bit more about the nuances um, between those three definitions farther along. But first we look at the foundation. And also I think it's worth noting that we don't always get to zero. It's not a perfect target. Um, but one of the things that I found really compelling in working in this field is it's the best driver for efficiency I have yet found in my career. Because even if you don't hit the absolute, you're striving for an unequivocal number. So that gets you to different places than just saying, oh, let's build something that's efficient. So the common foundation, as I mentioned here, is efficiency. And when we incorporate all these efficiency measures, what we get is what we call a ZNE ready building or ZNE home. By the way, I also want to mention that I'm focusing on homes here. Uh, we all live in homes. It's sort of the most universal form of architecture. Yet all these principles equally apply in non-residential buildings, just manifested in somewhat different equipment and systems and so forth. But again, same basic principles. So the components of the ZNA Ready home or building are first and foremost, efficient form and orientation. Secondly, a high performance enclosure. Third, super efficient mechanical systems. And I'm kind of cheating. I'm, I'm including hot water in mechanical systems for convenience. And then fourth, what I like to refer to as best in class electric devices. And then all that, presuming you have not only designed it with those uh, criteria, but also built it. We can't overlook the construction process and then commissioning, putting it into operation. 
So we have to be equally attentive in all those phases in order to achieve the structure that's efficient enough to be capable of achieving zero net operating energy, electricity, or emissions. Okay, so let's move on to the next, um, if I can get my page down button to work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, technology. That's right. So it's also important, again, efficiency is great. We all, I think, think of efficiency as being a good thing, but what really matters is the benefits that it carries with it. So what we get with that are lower energy use and the lower utility bills that go with that, improved comfort, you know, and increasingly where um, I live in Northern California, where we have frequently experienced in recent times, public safety power shutoffs. And so the ability of a home to maintain a comfortable temperature when the power is out is quite important in both winter lows and summer highs. So it's not just comfort, it's actually also a health and life safety issue. So we get better indoor air quality, quieter interiors, our hot water arrives faster where we want it. And of course, as utility costs rise, as they have a propensity to do, my several decades in life have taught me, we're protected against those raising costs. And of course, last but far from least, uh, we are doing our bit for climate change or trying to fight back against climate change. So there we have the, th the foundation. At this point, it's a very simple step to get from zero energy ready, ZE ready to zero net energy with the simple addition of a renewable energy system. So now um, note the small print here that renewable energy production must meet the home's total annual energy usage to qualify as a zero net energy home, including all fuels. And again, I'm in my, let's say general conversation here, I'm focusing on zero net energy because it is sort of the most common definition most widely understood, but I will again get into the nuances among the three at a certain point here. Okay, so when we add that solar system, we get further benefits with our z &E home. So free energy, obviously it's been paid for with the solar system, but from that point on, free when the sun is shining. Power when the grid goes down, if you've added a battery, and incidentally, I've learned from some of the solar vendors in California here that because of the public safety power shutoffs, fondly known as PSPSs, um, a, a very high fraction of their solar sales now are including batteries. This is getting really common. And of course, the PSPSs were followed rapidly by COVID, where we have people working at home and often with students at home. So you have a whole family that really can ill afford to lose power. So hence the rapid increase in popularity in batteries, notwithstanding the price tag. So I guess it's, it's a question of price versus value, right? Right, right. <laughs> so um, research has also shown that solar on a home adds about 4% to resale value. And of course, we're doing even better uh, versus climate with that. And when we do have a home that has all energy from renewables, that is zero emissions home. So that's one of our ZEs, say a little bit more later. I think it's important also to talk about the fact that a zero energy home isn't just a home any more than a car with a camper is just a car. Right, we tend to just talk about as if it's just another home, it's a slight variation, it's maybe you know, pink instead of blue, but actually it's quite a bit more than that. We're talking about a whole different functionality on that home, a mini utility added to the home. So it's kind of a, it's a little bit challenging to communicate that effectively, but it's definitely a significant value add and the way that's reflected in the budget is to think about shifting some of the money that goes into utility bills in a conventional home into the price of the mortgage itself and away from the utility bill. And so the net is not necessarily anymore. 
And in fact, I love this story from Jean Myers uh, of CEO of Thrive, Thrive Home Builders in the Metro Denver area. Jean is really one of my heroes in this arena because he's honestly one of the kindest, most humble and most accomplished guys I know in this industry. And Gene has many inspiring stories, but one of his stories is that they, when they started out with ZNE, they thought they'd offer it as an option. And he said, didn't sell, but he, they didn't give up because Gene is a pioneer. He doesn't give up. He, he gets accomplishes what he sets out to do. So he said, okay, well, maybe we should just build, build this in. So they redesigned from scratch and they found that they could actually build those ZNA homes about the same cost as they built them without the solar once they set out to do that as their goal. And he says now he, he's they're, they're easy to sell. He says, I ask customers if I give them $300 back a month in energy savings, would they give me $100 a month of that in mortgage? Easy peasy, right? I mean, it, the whole thing is just brilliant. So not only that, but Gene, as well as other builders have noted that building z &E gives them a market advantage. So here's a builder from a very, you know, very different part of the world. Ryan Scott and Avalon Master Builders are in uh, Eastern Canada. And um, Ryan has commented too, that they have seen these advantages from building z &E. So they've improved their position in the marketplace, they've learned from them, and everything about their product line has improved. Now it's notable that both these builders, and in fact, all the, the ZE builders that I've spoken with have basically said the same thing. You really have to design for ZE from the get-go. That's a really important thing. So <laughs> there we go. Sure. Well, I was just gonna ask you, so, um, in California, you have Title 24. Um, so first of all, what's what's the difference between Title 24 and ZE? &E? And then also, what are the differences between um, the three? You, you talked about the ZNEs, the the energy, electricity, and emissions. So let's talk about that a little bit. Sure, and and it's a good one to cover Title 24 because a number of years ago, the Energy Commission here in California was saying we're going to have ZNE. &E in an upcoming code cycle and then come 2019 we didn't and so there was a big confusion about that so a lot of folks were like well now we're at ZNE well no we're not and so it is important to distinguish that as a first thing so um, the energy commission always is driven by cost effectiveness that's a, a legislative requirement that every advance in our energy code has to be found to be cost effective by a very precise definition. And so what they found is they couldn't quite meet that. And so what, what we're required right now is to offset the electricity, uh, sorry, sometimes I can talk, <laughs> <laughs> offset the electricity loads um, of a conventional mixed fuel home with photovoltaics. So in fact, Title 24, 2019 is zero net electricity, not zero net energy. So that's the first distinction. And um, that is again, assuming that the electric loads are the standard ones in a mixed fuel home. And this means there's not um, a different requirement whether the home is in fact all electric or mixed fuel. So we exclude the loads of water heating and space heating from that calculation to determine the size of the PV load. Now, part of the reason also for this is what we call the duck curve, which is a big deal in California and Hawaii and Texas and a number of other places. What this means as we get more and more solar on the grid, we have essentially a glut, the duck's belly. We have over generation in the afternoon when the sun is shining and we're, we don't have enough uses for that. However, once the sun starts to set, we have this huge ramp up where we have our solar production plummets and yet people are going home and they're starting to cook and do laundry and watch TV and turn on computers for homework and so forth. And this is the ramp. 
And so this is, accounts for the, the shape of the duck. And what you're seeing here is year over year, as we've gotten more solar, the belly of the duck gets deeper and deeper and deeper. So also what we're trying to do in California is to say, um, maybe we shouldn't overdo the solar thing until we figure out the storage component. So I think we'll be getting there in uh, very, uh, the very near future because the state's emphasizing solar storage. But for the moment, we're, we're combating it by being at zero net electricity with new construction. So um, the difference then between zero net electricity and zero net energy is simply more PV to offset the rest of the energy loads, the space heating and water heating. And of course, the high performance installation and commissioning, still extraordinarily important, but it's not, all of that is not required in Title 24, although some of it is. And then as far as the emissions go, um, the difference here is that we get to net zero emissions from net zero electricity if it's an all electric home, so no in-home gas combustion, and if all of the home's energy is zero emissions. And that can come from either enough solar on-site um, with battery, so we're, we're not even relying on the grid at all, or if all the energy we buy off the grid is zero emissions. And we can do that in a lot of territories. For example, um, our, many of our utilities offer a premium service that is 100% renewable, as well as many of our community choice aggregators, uh, an increasingly common phenomenon throughout um, the West. So there we go. There are the three definitions. And, and again, the most common still is zero net energy. And yet you can see the commonality among all three. So. Very good. But th and that's great. I appreciate you distinguishing um, that for Title 24. I know we have a lot of um, uh, people on this um, on this call for from California, and so that's a that's a good distinction. And then to, to draw the differences there, I appreciate that. So, what what's the difference about designing a Z and E home versus any other home? Then, yeah, you know, interesting, Mark. It's not there's no silver dark, silver bullet. It's I like to say it's a bunch of hundreds of silver BBs. <laughs> okay. And so it's all about the details. And um, uh, I've broken those down here into six different categories. So we'll walk through each of these, the roof, the form, the plan, the enclosure, windows, and documentation. So first of all, starting at the roof, and seem might seem funny to start at the roof, but um, this is called keeping the end in mind when you begin the design process. And so whichever of the z &E goals you choose, that is going to dictate a specific amount of solar production. So you have to decide which of the, those you're achieving or which one you're required to achieve. And then it's a pretty simple calculation. It might look daunting. We've got um, energy use intensity. We need to understand our total load in kilowatts uh, of DC energy. How many square feet of photovoltaic array does that mean? And then what does that represent in terms of roof area? That might sound redundant, but I'll walk you through. It really isn't. Good. Okay. First of all, getting a target EUI energy use intensity, which is measured in thousands of British thermal units per square foot per year, is a simple lookup process. So we have those numbers here for California from a research study that's linked at the bottom of the page. And I'm giving an example um, here, uh, climate zone three in California. Um, by the way, I know that most of the country has uh, six, seven or eight climate zones. We have 16 in California, <laughs> which seems sort of nonsensical, right? It's like, how can you have 16 if the whole country only has eight? We're a little more granular, is all. A little, a little specific, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. So we can translate these into U.S. climate zones. And, and interestingly enough, we do actually have climate zones um, almost as extreme as anywhere in the country. Uh, our coldest climate zone has heating and cooling degree days, or cooling degree days, sorry, heating, like Chicago. And our hottest, of course, down in the, in the desert is much like Arizona. 
So we have a lot of those extremes. Anyway, this study gives us some target EUIs for ZNE homes, as well as other building types, by the way. And um, they're broken down by building type. We're showing this table now for single family residential. So, um, and I know these numbers are available for other sources um, throughout the country as well. So we get an EUI that we know is should be attainable uh, for a ZNE home. We work with that and we figure out our load. And the total load is also pretty simple. We use our EY multiplied by house size. That gives us a, a total KBTU per year. And then we look at that, we divide by 3.412 to get kilowatt hours per year. From that, we can get a solar production goal. And again, we have I've given a look up here, um, a simple place to look up where you can uh, find out how much solar energy a panel is going to produce in your area, your part of the world. And so for uh, my example average, I looked that up and found out that one kilowatt of DC peak capacity can put out 4.5 kilowatt hours per day or 1,642 kilowatt hours per year. So using that 1,642 number, dividing um, my 6,700 from the prior calculation, I find out that um, I'm going to need 4.1 kilowatts of DC power from my solar array. And I can also find out you know, what the production is here, again, in California, one kilowatt occupies about 68.4 square feet. Divide that and I find out, okay, I'm gonna need about 280 square feet, and that's uh, roughly 12 solar panels based on the average size of panels. So these are all readily findable numbers uh, on the internet, the source of, <laughs> Virtually anything one wants to know these days. Sure, <laughs> sure. So, but here's where it gets uh, the, the, oh, don't forget rule, right? So even though we've got 280 square feet of roof for the panels, we need more roof than that because in most areas, fire code requires clearance around the solar array. So again, using our California right. regulations, we have to add and say, okay, well, if we've got three feet on all sides, if we assume this is a, a two panel high by six panel wide array, and we add that, we're up to 364 square feet. And you'll know my little green call out without obstructions. And I think this is important because here's what you get if you don't pay attention to designing a roof without obstructions. This is what we call UG or ugly. So we try to avoid that. So that gives us a nice nifty segue to my second point, which is about form. And, you know, we've seen a lot of elaboration around form. Um, I think there's it's kind of an unfortunate tendency to equate beauty with elaboration, uh, something I really take issue with. And of the two homes here, I think if you if you didn't think the way I think, you might think the building on the left is quite handsome, and in some ways it is. But I look at that and I go, "Wow, that is just going to be so hard to heat, cool, insulate, air seal those those roof forms. That's just crazy, right? Also very expensive and really really chopped up for PV." By contrast, the house on the right, which is in fact a project of Thrive Home Builders, so they know what they're doing. We have a simple form that's still very charming, gracious, attractive, but a whole lot more practical, um, much easier to heat and cool, insulate and air seal. And look, their solar array doesn't look crazy. <laughs> right. So that's about uh, that. And a little bit more about the value of simplifying. This is a project I worked on a number of years ago where the homes on the bottom were an existing neighborhood and the homes on the top were a proposed new development. And the developer, which is a major university, had been told the community wanted them to emulate the design of the homes on the other side. And they engaged me as a, an energy consultant. And so I reviewed their plans 
And uh, I brought my checklist in to meet with them, the development team, which is a very experienced development team. And, and one of the first things I said is, so have you looked at the roof? They were like, um, no, why? And I said, okay, well, take a look here. What do you see? Well, in the proposed designs, it's hugely more complex, right, than the existing. They had done a beautiful job of emulating the look on the elevations, the facades, but they weren't really thinking about how that was translating into all these other costs. So just to sort of show you a, a thumbnail of the implications here, um, I've done this little, very rough calculation. I said, okay, well, let's just say for the sake of argument that every um, extra foot of perimeter costs you 300 bucks, right? And every extra corner costs you 500. And these are just, you know, kind of rough numbers, approximations. And I'm excluding, I'm not thinking about what's happening, the complications on the interior, the roofing complications, the design complications, right? Because that's a lot more drawing and detailing or the implications for the utilities uh, of the occupants of those homes ultimately. But I just said, okay, let's take a really, really simple 2,500 square foot plan. I've got three variations here. One that's got four corners, one with eight and one with 18. Using my numbers, I come up with an add-on of 9,000 bucks for plan B and 15,000 for plan C. So, and it's probably quite a bit more because of all those other issues. So that's just a, a again, a really quick example about the cost of complexity that we rarely think about. Okay, so moving on to plan, the second element. Now, HVAC isn't the first thing you think about when you think about developing a floor plan, but it's incredibly, grotesquely overlooked, in fact, mm. to the point where often there's no thought given to where the mechanical equipment is going to go. And this is a real oversight that I see in the design community, particularly residential, where it's um, almost always the job of the HVAC sub to figure it all out. Uh, I'm working on a project right now where I kid you not, there was so little thought, as in zero or negative thought, <laughs> that they put the equipment in the crawl space and they had to run the ducting through the crawl space wall up the outside of the building and back into the house i was wow. flabbergasted yeah. just but you know sadly that's not so far beyond the norm so it's really important that we actually plan for those systems and how to optimize them so I'm going to skim through a lot of this because there's there's way more detail and I know that you're going to make these slides available to folks. So Great. just want to say, let's not forget all these things. It's hugely important. And when we factor them in, they can be so much simpler as well as less expensive to build and uh, more efficient to operate. So here's an example of a project that I worked on with some colleagues in uh, Stockton, California, our Central Valley for Habitat for Humanity, where um, through a combination of you know, careful planning that considered HVAC, we have this very, very simple system with all the components in condition space and really short duct runs. Similarly, same project, also thinking about the compactness of the plumbing in the plan. And so you can see these little orange dots represent every single hot water draw in the house such that the longest pipe run is only 12 feet, which is wow. phenomenal. So you pretty much think hot water in that house and you have it, right? <laughs> <laughs> really, really smart thinking. The, the project manager on that uh, project is truly phenomenal. Okay, moving on to enclosure. Now, all this other stuff I've already said precedes what, where most people start to think about efficiency is at the enclosure, right? So it is important, but there's a lot to be thinking of first. So once we get to enclosure, we're thinking about framing, installation, and barriers. Framing, this is the same project in Habitat. It's kind of our poster child for many aspects of efficiency. Um, I've mentioned George Kurtzen, who's the uh, 
designer superintendent, wearer of all hats in that project. And George lives, eats, sleeps, and breathes efficiency. So these are his wall layouts. So really, really looking at minimizing thermal bridging as well as many other aspects of efficiency. Um, they're using both cavity and exterior insulation this project, and that's pretty common in uh, more severe parts of the, the country. However, we're still kind of newbies at this in the West because we've been blessed with many very benign climates. But um, I think it's really important to point out, first of all, that ideally we want to target above code R values when it's possible, always looking for quality installation. And I'm not a fan of bats. I like to say bat insulation is too often bad insulation, not because it's not possible to do a good job, but because so frequently the subs are just too pushed to um, offer a low price and not given the chance to do the proper job. Uh, so that's less critical with exterior insulation as well. And uh, given our climate concerns these days, I think it's also important to preference low carbon materials whenever we have the opportunity to do that. Another, I think, too often neglected aspect of the enclosure is the barriers, ensuring the continuity of all three, the air barrier, the water barrier, and the thermal barrier. And um, this drawing, which I'm sure is far too small for anyone to appreciate, I've given a live link to, which you'll get in the slide deck, and encourage everybody to download this drawing and use it as a model. Uh, the architects, Coldham and Hartman, are based in the Boston area, and they've been very generous in keeping this drawing up on their website and allowing anyone to download it and learn from it. I think it's a, a really stellar example of how to ensure the continuity of these barriers. And I believe every drawing set should have one of these to ensure doing a good job. Now moving on to windows, and I know this is probably a particular interest of many folks in your audience. Um, specs, yeah, hugely important, but there's also more. And I think that you know, in working with your clients and customers, um, to bring more into this conversation is really important uh, for zero energy homes. We're interested in the number of windows, their size, location, orientation, and exposure, all of which are part of the where, and then as well as the type, operating types. So a little bit about each of these. First of all, for ZNE homes, generally speaking on the projects that I've been working on, we find that if we get our U factors, a down below 0.27, 0.27 or better, that is lower, we're doing well. And similarly, solar heat gain coefficient at 0.24 or less. Now, I know there's still a lot of controversy about SHGC. Um, some people are, are fond of a higher SHGC that they think solar gain is great. It's very tricky because when we do a really, really terrific job with our z &E enclosures, very, very high danger of overheating these homes with uh, too high of a solar heat gain coefficient. So this is kind of my standard prescription here. And then of course we wanna keep our VT, the visible transmittance as high as possible at the same time without sacrificing the thermal value. Now moving on to the other issues, the strategies. So rules of thumb for me, how many? Not so many. What size? I like George's rule, try and fit them within the framing modules. I know very unpopular with architects, but if it's part of the thinking from the outset, as opposed to an afterthought, can be done. Where should they go? Well, where views are important, where cross ventilation is important, obviously egress, where not, where heat gains a problem. And my favorite is your knees don't really enjoy the view, right? <laughs> it's super difficult to uh, shade of windows effectively when they're low to the floor and a Western exposures, right? And then types of, of operation. I'm a big fan of hinged or compression clothes because by definition, they are tighter. And so they give us a better enclosure than our sliding operation windows. So again, principles of shading, 
Um, overhangs, again, have limited effect at low sun angles. So that means on both the east and west. And also is spring and fall, right? We can tend to forget that. And yet in a lot of part of the country, we can get a lot of heat um, during that time of year. So it's really important to consider if you have west windows uh, and you haven't done a good job of shading them by some means in the fall, you can roast. So hugely important. Okay, and similarly, skylights. Um, a lot of people love skylights. I say, really, you want to poke holes in your roof? <laughs> <laughs> Not just a moisture liability, but also uh, can be huge thermal liability. So I like skylights where you really don't have another good option. And here's a really nice graphic from the Florida Solar Energy Center showing a lot of different uh, shading strategies. Okay, uh, my final point of the six design issues, documentation. Now it seems really obvious, but honestly, when I have worked on projects where the teams have run into trouble, it's almost always because they thought they were gonna do something and then somehow it did not get into the CDs. Mm, yeah. And so this is something I think all of us who are involved in the process of designing and creating buildings can help make sure it makes happen. If we're gonna do something, especially um, a high performance specification, something that isn't the typical way things are done, and by the way, ZNE homes are not the way things are typically done. So by definition, we're probably doing some things that are a little unusual. We wanna get them in the CDs. So I can't really emphasize that enough. So we want to make sure also that the goals are clear, because one thing I learned as a parent is, you know, when you have a three year old who won't do anything unless he understands why. As adults, we sure as heck don't do anything without understanding why. So we tend to overlook that. We just tell folks what to do. And if it's not what they're used to, they're going to assume she's crazy, right? <laughs> this is the way we do it. So you really need the why. And then covering um, some of the key points, performance testing during construction, um, all that, if you want it done, it better be in your CDs. If you want verification done, it better be in your CDs. So not just the how to build it, but how to make sure it's actually working. And then drawings, all the usual. And then I showed you jo uh, George's George Kurtzen's wall elevations, which are wonderful. Here's some other drawings from George. He's showing exactly how he wants that plumbing done and exactly how he wants his mechanical installed. Like it really takes the guesswork out of it and makes sure that your design intentions aren't short circuited. And I already talked to you about the air leakage control, but um, I'm providing this link again, once more for emphasis. <laughs> This is a really important aspect of any drawing set. I'm starting to see more of them. I've been on this crusade for several years. <laughs> so we're we're getting there, but it's a slow process. So really encourage this. Yeah, it's good. It's an excellent resource. So so what about building a ZNE home? How is that different from conventional construction then? Great question. And again, it shouldn't really be any different, presuming you're following those CDs and, and they are all that I've said they should be. So just to sort of emphasize, again, clear goal communication. So once the uh, torch is handed over to the construction team, it's really up to the general contractor to make sure, again, all of his crew, her crew, all of the subs are on board with the goals and the whys, right? And also team problem solving. I think this is another thing that I see um, when things tend to go south. It's often because somebody decides to solve a problem on their own um, without necessarily consulting those who are involved in the initial decision making that may have resulted in some shortfall or you know just a, a hitch. Maybe there's a supply issue or something. Um, it's really important to take the time to go back to the folks who who made the decisions and say, so we can't quite execute as intended. What are we going to do to resolve this? 
So very important. And then monitoring the progress along the way um, and ensuring performance on completion. So again, all these things should be in the CDs and it's just really important that all those you know, I's get dotted and T's get crossed along the way with the, the optimum collaboration. So I think this is an important thing to mention too. And, and I really, this is a, a gospel I learned at the knee of uh, Rick Chitwood, who's been a real hero of mine um, in this industry. Quality management isn't up to the raider, right? The raider is just mm. checking the boxes. So it's up to the crew. And so you don't want to wait until the HERS Raider comes out to do a blower door, a duct blaster, or any other test. The crews should be doing this during construction to inform themselves that they have actually met all the criteria that have been set for the project. And here's an example from that same Stockton project. Um, that was a a project that was done with sponsorship by our uh, utility PG&E Pacific Gas and Electric. And part of what we did in that project was to document everything that happened in the Stockton home. And this is an example of the commissioning report for that home. And again, tiny, tiny type. Um, there's a link so you can download that report there. And these are indicative uh, numbers, but the point isn't so much the specific numbers for this house. But what it takes to demonstrate that you've hit all the targets, and these are targets that were set ahead of time. So that's a really important part of all this. So in the last few minutes we've got, um, what? let's talk about the growth and change that you've seen happening in uh, Z&E home building. It's been pretty phenomenal. Uh, there was a pretty humble start, you know, really the, the genesis of z &E was back in the post 70s and 80s, uh, the wake of the energy crisis. And then in the 90s, Passive House developed in Germany. Interestingly enough, it was based on work that was done here in the U.S. by Rocky Mountain Institute and Amory Lovins. Mm -hmm. And then uh, once again in the Rockies, uh, Habitat for Humanity in Metro Denver, developed the first home that was actually documented to operate at Zero Net Energy in 2006. So this is, in some ways, it's a much longer movement, but in terms of really, you know, measuring and documenting where, I guess this is year 15 that we're moving into, or year 16 we're starting, of formal z and &E. And um, as of mid-2019, there were about 22,000 documented z and &E homes in the U.S. and Canada. And now we're at almost 28,000. So uh, working with EBA and Team Zero, we are on the brink of publishing our fifth report on uh, inventories of zero energy stock in the U.S. and Canada. And this is what the growth curve looks like, with the dark blue bars being the number of housing units. The green bar is number of buildings. So we've got both single family and multifamily represented here. And then the turquoise, the short bar is the number of projects. And you can see by the difference between those three bars that the, all those numbers are actually in pretty big projects. And I'll show you a little bit more about that. First, to say in this inventory, what we mean by zero again is that we're we're casting a very broad net around this quite deliberately because all of these projects whether they're zero energy ready zero energy or even net energy producers they're all contributing towards this progression we're making towards more efficient homes we're also looking at projects in four stages uh, both completed projects and those under construction in design or even in planning although uh, most of our stats focus on the first three phases completed under construction and design, simply because the ones in planning may take quite long to come to fruition or fall by the wayside. And then again, both single multifamily as well as market rate and affordable. And we have found them all across the spectrum, which is pretty exciting as well as in all climates. And I like to point to London, Ontario, with their 6,300 heating degree days, if it can be done there, then can be done pretty much anywhere. 
Um, we've also got them in our, our really hot, dry climates as well. Um, some of our, our leading states are very small and yet um, really uh, outshining. One of the ways that uh, I've broken down these stats in some years is to look at the number of units per capita and sort of that's, that's a different chart entirely. That's also pretty fun to look at. But we've had also seen very consistent performance uh, among some of these leading states. And here's how this breaks down. Um, interestingly enough, many folks think, oh, z &E, well, that's just for the wealthy. Well, in fact, mm -hmm. multifamily increasingly is dominating this market, and a large fraction of the multifamily are affordable units. So we can just flatter that myth all to kingdom come. We're also finding an increase in performance. Um, more and more homes actually hitting zero energy where the dominance of zero energy ready is uh, giving way a little bit to higher performance. Another trend we're seeing is some of these uh, trends I've actually already referred to, uh, the increase of battery storage. We're seeing more and more interest in being all electric ready, even where we're not quite ready to be all electric ready. Electric vehicles are increasingly paying a part of the, the picture, along with performance monitoring and demand response. I mentioned the duck curve earlier, so there's more and more interest in how can we get all the parts in the home to actually play well with the grid. And in fact, uh, we're seeing that zero emissions homes. Uh, once again, I know uh, folks like to make fun of us in California because we're the crazy people out there who always do things differently. And in <laughs> fact, um, we are seeing a huge interest in zero emissions homes. Uh, could be because of all the crazy wildfire and other climate impacts we're experiencing, but also we're seeing that buildings represent a big part of the problem and the solution. And so what we are, we now have 40 plus local governments now that are either incentivizing or requiring all electric new construction. So we've, we're above 10% of our population, 4 million people that are now affected by these regulations. And they are, uh, it's coming on like, like well, wildfire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's pretty exciting though. Uh, honestly, for all my years in the building industry, I have never seen change happening so fast and I find it absolutely thrilling. And it's also a huge opportunity for those who jump on this bandwagon. So I'm going to encourage everybody to come on and play. The water's warm. The pool is delightful. <laughs> That's right. And here I provided a bunch of information resources for those of you who may be interested in delving further into this. And every one of these resources has embedded within it dozens, scores, hundreds of others. So at all kinds of detail available. Very excellent. And and like you said, we'll have this deck available to, to anyone who's who's interested. There's some um, amazing information, excellent information in here and resources that you provided and I really appreciate that. Um, and this has been uh, this has been great, very informative and I uh, appreciate um, uh, you, you make it in time. That was good. So um, we'll, um, we're going to open it up to questions now. And uh, um, if, um, if you're online right now, you can uh, put, a, put your question in the Q&A if you haven't already. And uh, we'll address those with Anne um, in the last few minutes that we have left. Um, but uh, um, appreciate your time, Anne. This has been awesome. My pleasure. And uh, look forward to hearing those questions.